That was a beautiful song. It speaks of Jesus, the, the great shepherd, going to save the lost, to leave the, the fold and go find the one that wandered off, the one that strayed, as the song says. The book of Revelation is, in essence, the shepherd in a way he becomes the sheep that was slain for the sins of all mankind. And in, in one way, uh, the book of Revelation is a call for the lost to come home, for the lost to be found, for those who call themselves followers of Christ who are beginning to wander and go astray, for them to come back to the fold. And so it is a story, even though there is lots of wrath, even though there's lots of disaster and calamity, it's all designed to bring and draw people to repentance. Now today we are going to begin wrapping up, or we are going to wrap up our study of the book of Revelation. Revelation meaning that which has been revealed. The veil has been removed, and now we should see very clearly. We see clearly the spiritual war that is raging all around us. We see that Satan is raging against the church. We see that there are worldly powers and false religions trying to lure each and every one of us away from Jesus. We see corrupted cultures sedu seducing us to follow their path rather than the path that our good shepherd has laid out before us. And we see that some followers of Jesus hold fast and they endure to the end. They overcome, they conquer all the calamities that they face. And we see others bow to idols. They worship the powers and princes of their day. Or we see them diving headlong into sin. And we see over and over again, Jesus gives opportunity for people to repent and to turn to him for eternal life. The shepherd continually calls out to the lost sheep to come home, find rest, find the water, the living water that never ends. We also recognize that one day the opportunity to repent, the opportunity to come home is going to run out. That is when Jesus returns. When he comes back, time's up. There are no last-minute decisions. There's no more procrastination. There's no more opportunity. When Jesus comes back, that is it. And this is something he promised and foretold during his earthly ministry, that he would ascend and he would sit on his throne in heaven next to the right hand of God, and that one day he is going to return to bring us to the place that he has prepared for us. And on the day in which he returns, he will judge the living and the dead. And this is one of the major themes of Revelation chapter 22. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you have some form of Bible, whether it's in paper form or digital form, uh, open up to Revelation 22 and follow along as we uh, go through this passage. In this passage, Jesus is going to reiterate his promise to return. But it is a promise that requires more than just knowing the promise. It takes more than just accepting the fact of his return. It's more than just believing that Jesus is going to return. It takes certain actions on the part of those who claim to believe in that promise. It requires something from us. And so when he returns... We need to ask ourselves, you need to ask yourself, will you be found ready? When Jesus returns, are you going to be ready? Are we going to be ready? Because it's not just about each and every one of us individually, it's about us as a whole. So Jesus is going to return. Are we ready? Now in this section, John is going to, he's actually, I hate chapter divisions in, in our Bibles because they kind of break things up where they shouldn't be broken up. Uh, this is a continuation of uh, the description of the beautiful New Jerusalem city that John saw coming down out of heaven prepared as a bride. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright, crystal, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or the sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So in continuation of this beautiful city of Jerusalem, John sees that there is this beautiful river flowing through the middle of the city. And it is a beautiful city of a uh, beautiful river flowing of living water that is unending. It is coming from the throne of God. God is the source of this river, the source of eternal life. In this scene, as we see those rivers, we see the trees, uh, this reminds us, this, this draws us back to a very particular scene in the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 2 and 3, God created the heavens and the earth, he created man, and he planted a garden, the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve would be, and they could hang out with God, they could walk with God, they could talk to God, they could, they could see God in his glory. But we know that they sinned and they were expelled from the garden. And God set up a guard so that they could not enter into the garden and eat from the tree of life. But at the end of time, Jesus, when he returns, is going to restore the original intent of the Garden of Eden. There is going to be eternal life for those who belong to God, that the curse that is brought about by Adam is going to be fully and finally reversed through the one man, Jesus. And everything is going to be uh, wonderful as it was supposed to be in the Garden. We will have no more shame, no more guilt, no more trying to hide from God. We will be with him in all of his glory. Without any veils, without any, any earthly flesh getting in the way, we'll be able to see him face to face. And everything that is broken by human sin and selfishness will be restored to exactly how God had it designed and intended and created it from the very beginning. In this scene in, in the garden, we see that it is a place of security and provision because God is with us. We have no need of fear. There is no darkness. There is nothing to, to hide from. There is nothing to fear because God is with us. He is our light. He is our glory. He is going to be everything that we need. And so in light of the brokenness of the world, as Mike pointed out in his community, communion meditation, that there are many things that are broken in this world, and we long for the day when all of these things are going to be restored and fixed and made new. And so we look forward to the day when Jesus is going to return, and we're going to be in a place where he is, where there is no more suffering, there is no more sorrow and death. And so we long for, we welcome the day of his return. And so when, we, when, we, when he comes back and we are with him for eternity, we don't have to worry about hurricanes. We don't have to worry about earthquakes and tsunamis. We don't have to worry about shootings. We don't have to worry about abuse or broken families or drug addiction or chronic illnesses or even death. All of those things are going to be gone, done away with. They're going to be thrown in the lake of sulfur and fire, never to be seen in all of creation again. And so Jesus will return. Are we ready for that day? John continues this way. He says, And he said to me, this is the angel who's showing him this vision of this new Jerusalem, These words are worthy, are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits, and of the, the, sorry, and the Lord, the God of the spirits, of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evil do doers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. So we, we learn from, from John and from, from Jesus that the words of this prophecy, they are true and they are trustworthy because they come directly from God. 
What John shows us and he describes to us in the book of Revelation is not something that is made up by him. John didn't just invent this because he tripped on some Roman mushrooms or something. He, he's not inventing this uh, so that he can get himself fame and glory. He, he is writing this, he's recording this as he is in exile on the island of Patmos. This is not something that was invented by the early church to explain their persecution, but this comes straight from the same God who spoke the universe into existence, the same one who, who spoke in, in the universes, in, or the universe, in the galaxies and the stars and the planets. All of these things came into existence by his mighty and powerful word. And by his word, the words of revelation were recorded by John. They are faithful, they are true, they are trustworthy. We can, we can anchor ourselves, our souls, our entire lives to these very words that John has revealed to us through the Spirit. And so Jesus, or John, or yes, Jesus in the midst of the, the section, he gives us a promise. He gives us a blessing. He says, blessed is, meaning the one who has everything right, the one who has it figured out, the one who knows what is going on is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy. Blessed is the one who doesn't just hear, but they keep the words of this prophecy prophecy. Now, keep doesn't mean to write it down and hide it under a bushel. No! It's not to hide it under and put it in, in a chest somewhere. It's not to, to take it and put it on a bookshelf or have, a, have one of those family Bibles and it sits on your coffee table and it never gets opened. What, what John says when you keep the, these words is that you hear them and then you live them out. You implement them in your life. You guard them in, in that you are implementing. You're, you're living by these words. You don't just know it. You don't just believe it, but you actually live out what Jesus is commanding us and teaching us in the words of the book of Revelation. So Revelation isn't just some grand theological treatise. It is a book that is meant for us to live out as followers of Christ. And so we are to implement it, live it out in our lives. It is not enough for us as followers of Jesus to just believe the right stuff. Even the de demons believe. Satan believes in the words of God. They shudder, but do they live it out? No, that's why they're going to end up in the lake of fire one day, because they are not living out the teachings that God has given. Even though they believe them, they believe in Jesus, they believe that he is the creator of the universe, but they don't live it out. They don't have the faith that we do. And you don't get to heaven simply by believing in these words. Because again, the demons believe and they shudder. But we are told over and over again in the book of Revelation that we are granted entrance into the New Jerusalem. We are granted entrance into eternity because we put our belief into action. And we call that faith. Faith isn't just trusting God intellectually. It is trusting Him enough to do what He says. It is believing in Him and, and trusting Him to the extent that you actually live out His teachings and His words. It's not enough to just call yourself a Christian. You have to live Christian. It is, a, it is more of a verb rather than a jersey or a label that you might wear. Here's an analogy I have for this. Say there is a 55-year-old person, and I have to kick the age up here because, you know, uh, Tom Brady, he's getting old, and so, like, he's too old to play, but he's still playing. You know, so we have to adjust the, this to make it more realistic. So there's a 55-year-old person who wears a football jersey. They know the plays. Like they, they, know, they can tell you the plays that the team runs because they, they watch the game. They know who all the players are. They know all of the rules of football, even the ones that they object to and they, they don't like. They still know the NFL rule book. Okay? And they throw a fit when things don't go their way. And, and say this person comes up to you and they say, you know what, I play for um, the New England Patriots. I know the plays. I have the jersey. Uh, I know the rules. I am a New England Patriot. And you would say, you're crazy. Because they're not, you know they're not a player because they're not on the field. You know a person is a football player by the fact that they actually get on the field and play the game. If you're not playing the game, you're not a football player. You're just a spectator. There are a lot of people who know about Jesus. 
There are a lot of people who know the playbook. They know the rules of the game. They know what is expected of those who are in the game. They wear the jersey. They have the appearance of being a follower of Jesus, but they are not a follower. They are a fan. They believe the things of Jesus. They know the things of Jesus, but they're not actually playing the game. They are just spectators in the sport of life. And so Jesus, his, his call, his command for us is to keep these words, to guard them in implementing them in our lives, to no longer being a fan, but that we are participants with what Jesus is doing in this world, that we are following him as he has called us to follow after him. And so a person who claims to follow Jesus but sits on the couch is not a follower. They are a fan sitting on the couch. And being a fan is not enough. We have to live by faith according to what Jesus has taught us and what he has revealed to us in his word. So Jesus will return. Are we ready? John continues... Verse 12 says, Behold, this is Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So the creator, again, of the universe has promised that he is going to return. And so we know that everything else that he has promised has come to pass, and so we know we can trust beyond a shadow of a doubt that he will, in fact, return. We also recognize that God is extremely patient. When we consider all the evils that have been done in history, especially things that were done in the 20th century and the millions and millions of people who died as a result of corrupt governments, for example, like we would say, well, Jesus, why have you not returned? And the answer is because God is patient. He wants as many people to repent and to be counted in the kingdom as is possible. And so he's giving us time, even though we keep making mistakes, even though we keep rebelling, even though we keep choosing other things besides him. He is being uh, patient and kind so that as many people would come to a saving knowledge of him as is possible. Jesus wants as many people as, as, as is possible to come into his kingdom. He doesn't have a, a limit. There's not like 144,000 and that's it. He wants as many people who would choose him to enter into the kingdom. And so we recognize that he is very, very patient. And as he describes uh, his, his, his promise of returning, we find that there is a second blessing. He says, blessed are those who wash their robes. And notice how this is an active thing. This is something that individuals are supposed to be doing. They are supposed to wash their robes. And this happens when we accept Jesus as our Savior, when we accept his, his forgiveness of our sins and he washes us clean with his blood. Uh, by, by faith we accept his forgiveness and he washes our blood, our, our, our robes with his blood. But we also recognize that in the book of Revelation, that washing our robes were, uh, means that we live faithfully for Jesus in this life. That we abstain from the evils of this world, that we abstain from the sins that our world so powerfully promotes and pushes and encourages. It, it means that we remain faithful in following Jesus in, in the midst of the most dire circumstances. That when we want to give up and follow something else because it's easy, that we stay faithful to Jesus. So this blessing, blessed are those, that, that God's favor is on the one who accepts Christ and they continue to live faithfully by faith in this life. And we are told very bluntly here that if a person continues to live in rebellion, if they continue to uh, engage in sorcery and sexual immorality, and they continue to lie and deceive uh, other people, uh, that they are going to be excluded from, the, from this new Jerusalem. They're going to be excluded from the kingdom of heaven. 
And again, we saw this last week in chapter 21. We've seen similar warnings in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5 and Romans chapter 1. When people rebel against God and they continue, they persist in their sin and their pride and their ego and their, their selfishness, that God will say, you know what, you have rebelled against me. You might wear my jersey, but you're rebelling against me. You have not really made me the, the Lord of your life because you, the way you're living, you're, you have someone else as your Lord. You're not coming in. And so Jesus has a very strong warning here for those who might wear the jersey, but they continue to live uh, like some other player, and he says, you're not in. It's like if I were um, to say wear a, a Steelers jersey, and I never go to a Steelers game. I go to all the Miami Dolphins game, games because they're actually a good team. Not really. <laughs> Falsehood. Okay. Um, you know, so, so I go to all the Miami Dolphins games. I buy Miami Dolphins mer uh, merchandise, even though I don't wear it because I'm wearing the, the, the Steelers jersey because I don't want to get lynched in, in this area of the country. Uh, you know, I, I check up on all the stats of the Miami Dolphins. I really don't care. I don't know who's the quarterback and all the players of, of the Steelers, right? So I am not really a Steelers fan. I'm wearing the jersey, but I'm really secretly a Miami Dolphins fan. You know, and, and oftentimes this is the kind of a game that we play. We wear the jersey, but we're living like we're a part of some other team. We're buying the merch. We're participating in the activities. But when it comes to actually living the game or living uh, as a, part, a member of that team, we're not really doing it. We're, we're claiming to follow one team, but we're actually following another and so we recognize that if we continue to follow someone else, if we continue to let somebody else be the Lord of our life, namely Satan and his ways, that Jesus is going to say, you're out. You're not coming in. And yes, that is a very strong warning. And it is something that we should not shy away from. And again, he here is talking to Christians who are tempted to go along with the ways in the world in which they live. And so this, you know, we say, well, he's talking about non-Christians, but really he's talking about Christians who are claiming to follow Jesus, but they're continuing to do these sorts of sins in open rebellion against God. And Jesus says, no, if you're going to follow me, you've got to go all in. You have to give me everything and live according to my way, not according to your own way or the way of the world. Follow after me. And so it's time for us to stop playing the part, and we need to start living the life. It's time to stop playing church, and it's time for us to be the church. That is what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to stop being lukewarm like the church in Laodicea, to stop uh, pretending like we're following Jesus, but we're really just self-reliant and we're in this for ourselves, that Jesus calls us as Christians and calls us as the church to be the church, to be the followers, to stop pretending, to stop wearing the jersey, and actually start playing the game. And so Jesus will return. Are we ready for that day? The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share from the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So Jesus gives us a very strong warning in the end of this book. He says for us not to take away or add anything to the words of this prophecy. And this is a very strong warning that we must heed. And there are all sorts of things, for example, that we add. Like, what, what, what do people add to the book of Revelation? Well, there are all kinds of things that people add, um, such as the Antichrist. Have we encountered the word Antichrist anywhere in the book of Revelation? He's not there. Stop adding them. Have we read anything about a new temple being built in Jerusalem? No, it's not there. Don't add it. Have we seen anything about a rapture? No, it's not there. Have we seen anything about microchip implants in our hands? No, we haven't seen anything. So none of these things are in the book of Revelation. There's no one world government. There's no... no 
exact timelines of the end of time. And so we need to stop adding these things into the book because when we add these things, we actually end up taking away from the message. The message of the book, which is you're living in a very terrible place. God is going to judge this terrible place. And you want to make sure that you're on Jesus' side because when you're on Jesus' side, you're going to be with him forever. And so there's, there are two sides. There's God's side, there's the world's side, or Satan's side. And Satan is going to get defeated. Jesus is going to win, so you need to choose your side appropriately. That, that's the central message. But when we make it about timelines, or we make it about, is, is this person, is this Donald Trump, or is this Barack Obama, or is this Vladimir Putin, like we, at, we try to read it, you know, and inject different things in there. No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. This is a message, a call to faithfulness for the church in all ages. When we add things in there, we try to read things that aren't there, then we end up taking away from the, cent yeah, the central message of the book. But we also take away from the book by not actually living it out. He says, he, this warning is to those who hear. We are all hearing this book. We have heard this book, and we do not, we take away from it when we don't actually live it in our lives. Or when we excuse ourselves um, from the things that Jesus says, like, don't do this, we say, well, that doesn't really apply to me, okay? You know, this whole sexual immorality talk, you know, it, it doesn't apply to me. We live in a world that is so enlightened now that it doesn't matter whatever way you want to express yourself in this regard. It, it, it's, it's fine. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really apply to me. Or it, it's just a little white lie. You know, it says don't, don't love uh, falsehood. It's just a little white lie. Or I'm just you know, putting a little bit of political spin on there. It's no big deal. It's still the truth, mostly. You know? It's the, these things that, that we, we say it doesn't really apply to me, and we, we excuse ourselves as to and continue to engage in these behaviors. And Jesus says no, and so we take away from the book by by ignoring it, and we, we say we don't have to follow it when really we have to follow it. And Jesus says if we if we take away if we don't, if we don't keep these words that we are going to be counted in essence we're going to be counted with unbelievers. And oftentimes, like, we want uh, all the, the messages of the Bible to be happy and cheery and uplifting. And there's so many uplifting things in this book, even in this chapter. But sometimes we take away from the fact that Jesus is kicking the church in the butt and trying to get our stuff together. When you read the first uh, chapters 2 and 3, he's written, writing these letters to, uh, to seven churches in Asia Minor. Two of them have done nothing wrong, but five of them have done things that are wrong. And Jesus says, y'all need to get your stuff together now. Stop playing church. Stop engaging in these sins. Get your stuff together now. And sometimes we take away from that by, by not listening to what he says and not getting our stuff together and not following him and being the church that he wants us to be. And we make it about ourselves rather than about him and his kingdom. And so we cannot, we should not take away that there is so much hope, but there is also so much rebuke that Jesus wants to step on our toes because he wants us to repent and be drawn close to him. But for those, and so those who are, those who are playing the game, those who are wearing the jersey but not actually playing the game, for them the day of Jesus' return is a very fearful event because they know that they have it coming to them. But for those who are following Jesus, whose robes are washed, those who are actually living out what Jesus says, the day of his return is going to be a great and joyous day. It is a, joy, a day that we look forward to, that we long for, that we desire to actually happen. And we see that at the end of this book, there is such a strong desire, a, a call for Jesus to return. We have the spirit and the bride calling out to Jesus, Jesus, come back, return. And the bride is the, the church. The church is longing for Jesus to return. She's not afraid. She is welcoming that day because it's going to be a great day of a wedding celebration. And this new Jerusalem is going to be an amazing celebration. He says, those who are thirsty are, are to call there to cry out for Jesus' return because they know that they are going to be satisfied. Those who hear and they keep the, the words, they call out for Jesus to return. Oh, Jesus, will you please come back? We want you to come back. And I wonder how many of us have such a strong longing, a strong desire for Jesus to return. For some, they don't want Jesus to come back because they are engaged in sin and they don't want to be found out. They want to be discovered in their sinfulness. Or some people are having so much fun in this life that they really don't look forward to the next. 
They're, they're so busy doing, being entertained and following their pleasures in this life that they don't really think about what is coming in the life to come. Or maybe some are just apathetic and they really don't care. Like, oh, Jesus is coming back. That's, that's great. That's, that's a good fact to know. But it doesn't really inspire. It doesn't cause an emotional reaction in them. And, and they're just so apathetic and they really don't care about Jesus coming back. Or others, like, say, a lot of the, the Christians of the first century, that they were so overwhelmed and, and discouraged that they could hardly see past their uh, scenario, their situation. They could hardly see the possibility of Jesus coming. So, so as they look ahead, and there is no way that Jesus is going to come back. Look how evil and terrible all this is. If he, if he was going to come, he was going to come back already. Like, and so maybe it's just because of discouragements. Or being overwhelmed, you just can't see the fact that Jesus is going to return. But the beautiful thing is that Jesus is going to return. It is going to be a day of comfort and celebration and power and awe. And, and we are going to bow down. We're going to worship at his feet. And it's going to be a marvelous time as we see the one who died for our sins and came back to life and ascended to heaven. We're going to see him face to face. And all the, the sorrows of this life, all the, the, the things that keep us down, all the, all the struggles that we have in this life are going to be eradicated in the blink of an eye. And everything is going to be so awesome and beautiful with God, our Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And so Jesus, John, the early church, implores us to be ready for the return of Jesus. Be ready for the day that Jesus is going to come back to this earth. And the fact that Jesus is going to come and, and the, the, the desire to be ready ought to change who we are. The fact that he is going to return should change our values. It should change our priorities. It should change our actions and our attitudes. Meaning that Jesus should be the number one thing in our lives. It is, a, it is he who we seek after him, his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all the other things that you're concerned about in life will be added unto you. Seek first, primary. The, the, your first instinct is to seek after Jesus, to long for Jesus and his kingdom. And we do that, our priorities are aligned with his, and, and the things that we do are in alignment with his will and his teachings and his instructions. And the attitudes that we have towards God and towards one another are based in who Jesus is, his grace, his love, his patience, his kindness, uh, the, the, the love that we find in uh, 1 Corinthians. Like These are the attitudes that are part of who we are because we know that Jesus is going to return and we want to conform ourselves to him in this life because we, we acknowledge that doing so that we will be with him for an eternity and also knowing that Jesus is going to be going to return and, and the fact that we are ready is going to give us hope in the midst of difficulty when we acknowledge that Jesus is going to return, when we are in the worst situations of our life, when we look at the world and we see all the sins that are going on in the world and, and people seem to get away with it, that there are all these murderers and rapists and all these evil people that, that they, they just continue to do their evil things, like Jesus is going to come back and he is going to punish all of that sin. He's going to judge and, and he's going to reward the faithful. And so it is a, a great day that we can look forward to that. Even all the difficulties that we face in life, it is worth it. Because we're going to be with Jesus forever. And so Jesus is going to return, but we do not know the day or the hour. Jesus told us over and over again in several different parables in Matthew 24 and 25, we have no idea when he will return. And so the implication is that we need to be ready every second of every day. So be ready. Don't just hear. Don't just listen. Don't just acknowledge the fact that you need to be ready. Actually get yourself ready. Ready. Listen to the words of Jesus. Keep the words of Jesus and how you live them out every day of your life. In chapter 16, Jesus said, Behold, I am coming like a thief. You have no idea at what hour of the night I am going to come. So blessed is the one who stays awake, who keeps his garments on. Meaning that they don't go walking around and, and sinning and engaging in things that Jesus says are detestable. So that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. So Jesus is, will, is going to return. Do whatever it takes to be ready for that day. So John ends the book with these words. He says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. 
The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So Jesus has told us to be ready for his return. And the key to being ready for that day is found in the last words that John pens in his book. It's not by our strength. It's not by our abilities, because we know that we are sinful, we are weak. Oftentimes we are slaves to the flesh. So it's not by our strength or our own ability, but it is 100% by the grace of Christ that this is possible. Grace is the favor from Jesus that we do not deserve. It is the price for our sin that he paid on our behalf. By his grace, he gives us the knowledge and the strength that we need through his spirit. He gives us his words that we know what is expected of us. And he gives us the spirit to help us to live it out in our lives. He gives us the church that we can encourage one another, that we can strengthen each other when we see somebody is tripping up or they're weak or, 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 or maybe they need some maturity, that we can come alongside them and we can help them so that they too can cross the finish line with us. He gives us his word. He gives us his spirit. He gives us his strength church all because he loves us and he pours out his grace every single day and so jesus wants us to be ready and through his grace he will make us ready so do you do do we do i have the faith to hold on to christ and to be faithful to him and live by his grace so that i may be ready on the day of his return.